Let's dive into God's word. If you have your Bibles, so please open up with me to Acts chapter 22. That's where we will be spending our time. Acts chapter 22. That's found on page 925 in the Bibles in front of you. Let me start by telling you a story about a man who lived in 400 AD. This man, not a biblical character by any means, but definitely infamous. He goes down in history as being a man who challenged the cultural norms of Rome. His name was Telemachus. He was a monk that studied first in a monastery in Asia, but finally felt like it was time for him to go out and serve God in the public world. So he chose Rome of all places because he knew Rome was the center of the world. He arrives in Rome as the story goes, to find a bustling city, all of trying to figure out what, what's happening. He, he's asking questions. Why, why is everybody excited? The Romans had just beat the Goths, and the emperor of Rome said, we're going to celebrate by having gladiator competitions in the arena. So everybody to the Colosseum will have a circus of events, and we'll watch these men fight to the death. Telemachus stands there in the arena amongst the crowd. Imagine, he's been in a monastery most of his life, completely overwhelmed by what's happening. He hears the screaming people, the shouts of everyone. No doubt he sees the emperor even come, sit in his chair and is taken back by how everybody seems to worship the emperor. These men march out into the arena, the gladiators. They stand in front of the emperor, almost at attention, and they say, As men who are about to die, we salute you, emperor. He's trying to make sense. What does he mean? Men that are about to die, only to then to watch the games begin. And there the gladiators start fighting to the death. Telemachus literally starts shouting, In the name of Jesus, stop! But over the crowd, nobody can hear him. Almost as an impulse, he jumps over the wall and onto the floor of the Colosseum and starts running straight at the gladiators, all the while yelling, in the name of Jesus, stop! In the name of Jesus, stop! In the name of Jesus, stop! The crowd just begins to laugh. They thought it was some actor, a comedian, part of the play, part of the entertainment. The gladiators didn't know about it, so... They themselves even begin to laugh. They stop fighting each other. They watch this monk trying to stop them. In the name of Jesus, stop. To which one gladiator goes, well, I'll just take him out. And he starts to swing his sword at this man. Pretty soon they all started chasing the monk around the arena. And all he kept yelling was, in the name of Jesus, stop. In the name of Jesus, stop. Finally, the gladiators kicked up so much dust around this man, not everybody could see even what was happening. They all stabbed their swords into him, and there he laid, dead in the arena. The crowd went to a silent hush. The dust settled back on the floor. They realized this was not an act. This was a monk trying to stop these men from killing each other. And in his last breath, he yells out, In the name of Jesus, stop! And the Colosseum was utterly silent. As the story is recounted, they said that you could almost hear his last words in the name of Jesus stop echo around the Colosseum in a dead silence. Then finally, one at a time, people started getting up and just walking out of the Colosseum. The emperor himself, with all of his entourage, stand up and exit the Colosseum. Soon the Colosseum is totally empty with Telemachus laying there on the ground with the swords stabbed in him. It's said that within an hour of that event, the emperor of Rome released a statement, we will no longer have gladiator battles. And that was the end of gladiator battles in the Roman world. One man who had the courage to jump a wall and to say, in the name of Jesus, stop. True courage comes only when we are in Christ. True courage comes only when we 
are in the name of Christ, to use a biblical term. The idea of being in the name of Christ is to say all of his character, all of his attributes, all that he is now is around me. I'm in him. I'm surrounded by him. I'm, I'm in him and I'm living in his name. I'm doing my actions in his name. If you want to have courage in your life, then you must be living in the name of Christ. Today I've entitled my message, Where Does Courage Come From? Where, where, where is the source of courage? Where do we find it in our lives? Listen to me, your life demands courage. You have to have courage for the things you face. Whether they're health issues, their career changes, raising kids in the crazy world that we live in, having a marriage that pleases Christ, being a Christian in a world that is constantly turning post-Christian or even opposed to Christianity, you must have courage. Where does courage come from? I want to show you where courage comes from today. Now listen to me, believers, if you know Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, you have to have courage because you're following a man who literally died on a cross for you. The very center of our belief system is the death of our Savior. So courage is demanded from those of us who follow Christ. And if you are not a Christian, then I'm glad you're here and I'm glad you're listening. But let me say to you, if you don't know Jesus Christ, your courage will run out. At some point, everyone in your life will abandon you. People will turn on you. There will be people that you thought would always be loyal and they will turn on you. And you yourself will run out of courage at some time. And I don't want you to live one day past this day without the courage of Jesus Christ. So if you don't know him as your Lord and Savior, let me introduce you to a Savior who will never abandon you, who will never leave you, who will never betray you. And I hope to do that through our time together in God's Word. In the passage that we're looking at in Acts chapter 22... We're picking up with a man who had great courage, the Apostle Paul, after he'd just been beaten by a mob and stopped. He's now put in front of another mob or a trial to somehow see if the, he should be killed or if they should just do away with him. You remember prior to this instance, at the end of 22, chapter 22, the people actually started screaming away with this man, verse 22, we want to get away from him, away with such a fellow. He should not be allowed to live. Now he's having to speak to a crowd who wants his existence wiped off of planet Earth. We're going to look at the story of how he responds. And then today you will be confronted with a choice. Will you be one who has boldness of Christ this week? Or will you try to live out your life in the next seven days, with your own strength, which will it be? That's the question I believe this passage poses to us. So let's pick up Acts 22, beginning in verse 30, after the beatings had stopped, perhaps some night of rest in a jail cell had happened. Paul is now pulled back out by the Roman rulers to say, I'm going to get to the bottom of why the Jews hate you so bad. So it says this in verse 30, but on the next day, desiring to know the real reason why he was being accused by the Jews, he unbound him and commanded the chief priests and all the council to meet, and he brought Paul down to set him before them. So the Roman rulers of the time are now saying we want the religious rulers, which would have been known as the Sanhedrin, this ruler of about 70 men, uh, made up of Pharisees and Sadducees, I'll explain all that to you in a moment, they are now to try. Paul. And the Roman rulers are saying, why do you religious rulers have such a problem with this guy? Why are you wanting to kill him? So they put him before the Sanhedrin. Verse 1 of chapter 23. And looking intently at the council, Paul said, brothers, I have lived my life before God in all good conscience up to this day. And the high priest Ananias commanded those who stood by him to strike him on the mouth. Then Paul said to him, God is going to strike you, whitewashed wall. Are you sitting to judge me according to the law, and yet contrary to the law, you order me to be struck? 
I think there's a structure to this passage that will help you understand it. Let me begin to lay that out for you. There's four main parts to the verses we're looking at through verse 11 today. The first is Paul's persecution. Paul is put before the Sanhedrin and persecuted because he is believing in Jesus Christ and the Jews thought he was speaking against the law of Moses and specifically speaking against the temple. So they're persecuting him. He probably wasn't surprised by that because Christ himself said, hey, don't be surprised when they hate you because they hated me first. But nonetheless, here is this man who's been beaten the day before, probably didn't sleep well. He, was, uh, had, uh, he has all sorts of people that are ready for him to be killed and he stands in front of these men and notice the phrase, it says he looked intently at them. I have to wonder, was he staring them down because he was trying to recognize them? Some commentators believe Paul didn't have very good eyesight. So maybe there he's squinting like, I was here 25 years ago. You guys have grown more facial hair, gained more weight. I see you. I know some of you. You know me. Because he would have. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He would have run with some of these men. So perhaps he's looking intently to say, I know you. I recognize you. Some say maybe he's looking intently because it was early in the morning and dimly lit by torches. So he's trying to look through the darkness. Who's here? Who's trying me? Or perhaps he's being like Proverbs 28.1, as bold as a lion. The righteous are as bold as a lion. So perhaps it was that look intently like, oh, really? This is how this is going to go down? The wicked flee when no one's pursuing, but the righteous are as bold as a lion. So with intensity, he looked at them. And then it says the, the, the high priest has him hit. He says, strike him on the cheek. Hit him in the mouth. To which Paul then replies back and said, really? Is that what you're going to do? God is going to strike you, you whitewashed wall. I like that. I like the vigor. I got to tell you, if I got hit in the mouth, I probably wouldn't say another word. He opens his mouth immediately. And he doesn't just open his mouth to call names. He opens his mouth to draw attention to them being hypocrites. He says, you're striking me. The, 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 the Jewish understanding of the law was that they were not to strike another Israelite. In fact, there's two main statements in the Jewish law. The first is, he who strikes the cheek of an Israelite strikes as if he were striking against the glory of God. The other is, that if you strike a, a Jew or an Israelite, it's as if you're striking God. You're punching God. So he's saying, you're striking me? You're hitting the glory of God? Really, that's how this is going to go? You whitewashed wall. You're judging me, and yet you yourself are breaking the law? Now, there's a couple things I love about that. Not only his boldness, but he's continually keeping in mind that God's word, the law, which they're judging him against, must be observed. So he's saying, you're trying me for not observing the law, and you yourself just did exactly what the law said not to do. And he calls him a whitewashed wall. The whitewashed wall, whitewashed tomb, this, this is something that would have happened in Paul's time and at Jesus' time. What they would do is they would take a tomb, they would bury a, a body into it. It would have been look, looked a lot like a cave with a stone that rolled up in front of it. They would reuse these graves, but they would literally paint the front of them, the wall of them, white. They would do that as a warning to say, hey, listen, there is a decaying body on the inside. You don't want to come near here. This is not a hideout. This is not a, a stall for your animals. So we paint it white as a warning. Don't come near here. Death is on the inside. So when he says to them, you whitewashed walls, you look all pretty on the outside, but death is on the inside of you. Ho, 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 ho. Now that's, that's some kind of Jewish insult, right? That is, that's crazy. Try that one this week. No, don't try that. That would be sinful. Don't do that. He's calling He's calling them to live a single standard life. Those who stood next to him, verse 4, said, Would you revile God's high priest? And Paul said, oh, I didn't know, brothers, that he was the high priest. For it is written, You shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. Well, look at that. He's quoting Exodus 22, verse 28. The word of God is just on his mind. 
So they say, really? You're going to speak back to the high priest that way? And Paul immediately has remorse. He immediately has regret. He's like, I'm sorry, I didn't know he was the high priest. That it would be wrong of me and I would be contradicting what is written in Exodus 22, that I'm not to speak against God's ruler, God's leader. So he has this moment where he realizes he's lost control. Some sense is spoken back into him, perspective of the situation. And then he comes back and even almost has respect, remorse and then respect to say, I'm sorry I even went there. In chapter 24, you'll find he also mentions his regret over how he acted in that moment. That's a man who's paying attention to every detail of his life. The next segment of this passage I would call Paul's predicament. So now he was just struck in the mouth by the men, commanded by the high priest. Paul recognizes his error. He's trying to live in obedience to the scriptures. So he had to be thinking for a moment, now what do I do? The high priest is even against me and he's not even obeying the law. He then realizes, oh, I'm in front of the Sanhedrin. I mean, he would have realized it prior to that. But all of a sudden, the thought had to come into his mind, perhaps by the power of the Holy Spirit, perhaps by his own wisdom. He realizes the Sanhedrin's here, which means there's Pharisees and Sadducees in the room. Let me explain them to you. The Sanhedrin is made up of two groups. First, Pharisees. Pharisees are those who abide by the law, down to the letter of the law. They're legalistic in every way. They're making sure that they obey every single law. Even today, there are some who live Pharisaical lives. There's no longer a group of Pharisees around, but those who observe the Jewish law. Now, there's 613 Jewish laws, and so they're observing every single one of them, making sure that they never compromise any of them. But they believed in the resurrection of the dead. They also believed in spirits, and they believed in angels. That's different than the Sadducees. The Sadducees, they were uh, like the Pharisees in that they obeyed the law, but they were uh, more liberal in how they lived their lives, and they didn't believe in anything supernatural. They didn't believe in the resurrection of the dead. They didn't believe in angels. They didn't believe in spirits. So there was a rift between them two. Now, there was probably only about 6,000 Pharisees, even at the time of Christ. It's not a large number. There would have been a larger group of Sadducees. The Sadducees probably were the main leaders here in the Sanhedrin, but they don't believe in any kind of supernatural power. Specifically, let's underline, the resurrection. Big deal when it comes to Jesus Christ, right? They don't believe that the resurrection can happen. So Paul, in his wisdom, in the midst of this predicament, he, he speaks up to them and he starts to kind of call out what's happening here and this rift happens between them. Let's keep looking at this. Verse 6, now when Paul perceived that one part were Sadducees and the other were Pharisees, he cried out in the council, brothers, I am a Pharisee and even a son of a Pharisee. It is with respect to the hope of the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial. And when he had said this, the dissension arose between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. Brilliant. Brilliant. He's in a predicament. They're all against him. And so what does he do? He speaks up here in this moment, and he kind of turns them against themselves. It reminds me of those in Gideon's army, where all of a sudden they start fighting against themselves. So that, the enemy was so taken over. This was what I call Paul's ploy. Paul's predicament was overcome by Paul's ploy. Now, I don't think this was manipulative necessarily, perhaps even divinely inspired, but he knew that these two sects were here. He suddenly speaks to it, and, and it's almost as if they forget why he's on trial. They start fighting about the resurrection of the dead. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 19, Jesus promised, he said, when they deliver you over, do not be anxious how you are to speak of what, or what you will say, for, you are to, for what you are to say will be given to you in that hour. That's the words of Christ. Christ said that to his disciples, to the other apostles, but certainly in this moment, Matthew chapter 10 verse 19 proved true for Paul. He knew exactly what to say, and that provided his exit. God gave him a way out. Let's keep reading. This ascension happens in verse 7. For the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, nor angels, nor spirits, but the Pharisees acknowledge them all. 
So the Pharisees, they believe in a resurrection. The Sadducees, they don't. That's why they're sad, you see. Yeah, get it? Okay. <laughs> That'll help you remember it. Then a great clamor arose, and some of the scribes of the Pharisees' party stood up and contended sharply. We find nothing wrong with this man. What if a spirit or an angel spoke to him? And when the dissension became violent, the tribune, afraid that Paul would be torn to pieces by them, so this is the Roman ruler, the tribune says, commands the soldiers to go down and take him away from among them by force and bring him into the barracks. Paul's exit is divinely given to him, perhaps by the prompting of the Spirit, the promise of Matthew 10, 19, where now he can say, listen, you guys fight amongst yourselves, I'm out. And the Roman guards take him out and his life is saved. It's, it's an unbelievable story, Paul's persecution, Paul's predicament, Paul's ploy. But the part that I want to spend the remainder of our time on is verse 11. This is the part of the passage I call Christ's presence. Well, Christ has been a part of this entire thing. It's been about Paul, 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 but now Christ. In Acts 23, verse 11, it says the following night, the Lord stood by him and said, Take courage, for as you have testified to the fact about me in Jerusalem, so you must testify also in Rome. Oh, man. This week I was reading this passage and I came to verse 11. And literally I was sitting on my couch, I had my laptop on my lap, my Bible was open. And all of a sudden tears just welled up in my eyes. Because I, I, I was as if I could picture the discouragement that Paul must have been feeling and the sweet balm of Christ's presence that met the open wound in his soul. He had been rejected by his own people. If you remember, he was so stone-faced in his resolve to get to Jerusalem and preach Christ. He gets to Jerusalem, he preaches Christ, he's almost beaten to death at least twice. A whole night goes by. Discouragement had to be all around him. Hopelessness, disappointment, doubt. God, did you really call me here? Is this how it's all going to end? It tells us that a whole day passed, 24 hours, and Paul's condition had to feel like an eternity. And there he sat, hoping, praying, questioning, asking God, God, is it all over and God gives him perhaps the sweetest gift besides his initial meeting with Christ in salvation. God gives him the sweetest gift of having Christ stand by him. Do you see the words there? The Lord stood by him. The Lord had appeared two other times besides the initial time to Paul. But at once it was in a trance. He was seeing a vision. The other time it was in a dream. Now Paul is in a prison cell, and it says that the Lord Jesus Christ stood by him. Come on. In a moment where he had to wonder, where is everyone else? I mean, if you're reading your Bible with your eyes open, you have to ask the question, where's James? Where are the apostles? Where is the early church? Seemingly, all the Christians in Jerusalem have somehow scattered and are nowhere to be mentioned in this passage. So maybe even there, in that moment, Paul is in his prison cell, feeling utterly alone. And God gives him the gift of Christ standing by him. I remember being in Israel, going through one of the hardest seasons of my entire life. It wasn't because of Israel. It wasn't because of the tour. There were things going on back home, some consequences of my own poor choices prior that were coming out, and friends that were betraying me. And I was in another country, wasn't able to do anything about it. I, my wife wasn't there. And I remember I would go to my hotel room, and it was so alone. It was me and the flies. And I would sit there, literally by the window, and, and, and just the loneliness was overwhelming. And the flies literally were everywhere, and they would land on my legs, and they would land on my arms, and it was something 
This shows you how lonely I was. It was something that was almost comforting to me, like, well, at least you guys are here, right? <laughs> Have you ever been there? Have you been to a place where you're so lonely and you're like, maybe God's not even here? I mean, the author of Psalm 88 seems to get to that. He says, darkness is closer to me, God, than you are. Where are you? Loneliness is one of the worst feelings we'll ever feel in our life. Loneliness in marriage, it happens to many people. And I'll tell you, loneliness in marriage is probably the worst kind of loneliness you can ever experience. Loneliness in circumstances where your friends, who you thought were friends, betray you, that, that hurts like nothing else. And the moment where suddenly you feel like God's not even present, that, that will play with your mind. And here in his prison cell, he's wondering, what is happening? And it says, the Lord stood by him. He's standing next to him in some physical manifestation. Let's believe that it's him in the flesh. The risen Christ is standing next to him. And the first word out of his mouth is this word, tharse. It is one word in Greek. It is two words in English. It is take courage. He says to him, take courage, Tharse. It's to dare to be bold. It's, it's, it's to be confident. It's to be of good courage. It's to be cheerful. He hears the audible voice of Christ cry out to him in the darkness of his loneliness. Take courage. This word is powerful. This Greek word is only used five times in the New Testament. One other time as a noun, but five times as a verb. And all of the instances of this word being used are used by Christ and Christ alone. In Matthew chapter 9, verse 2, Jesus speaks to a bedridden, paralyzed guy, and he says to him, take heart, or Tharse, have courage. To the woman who had been bleeding for 12 years in Matthew chapter 9, verse 22, thinking there was no way out of her hemorrhaging, he just says to her, Tharse, take heart, have courage. To the guys that were shaking like leaves on the Sea of Galilee in the midst of the darkness, thinking they'd somehow lost Christ. There's a ghost coming near to them. The storm is tossing them. He says to them, while walking on water, Thorse, take courage. And in John chapter 16, verse 33, in the upper room on the night of the crucifixion, the night before the crucifixion, the night of the trial, Jesus uses this word, take heart. Courage. In the Old Testament, the Hebrew word that would be the parallel to this, it actually is make yourself strong. And in the Old Testament, prior to Christ on earth, it seems to be that we are to have courage, like Joshua 1 9, be strong and courageous. This idea of it's virtuous to us to have courage in and of our own strength, to have a quality in our mind that, that somehow musters something up in our soul that we're ready for battle. That's how the Old Testament seems to portray it. In fact, in chapter 8 of In verse 7 of the Proverbs, it talks about this idea of courage being a cardinal characteristic of our lives. But all that gets flipped on its head in the New Testament. In the New Testament, the absence of the word courage is astounding to me. I can't find it except in verses like this where you see Jesus himself saying, take heart, have courage. It's as if he's saying, have courage in me. I'm the only place where your courage should come from. It isn't you mustering it up. It isn't your own virtue of being brave. But rather, it's courage found only in Christ. What does this mean for us? 
Here's, here's the main point I want you to get today. For the Christian, courage is not a virtue, but a way of life based on faith in the presence of Christ. Courage is not a virtue you seek out. But courage is the outcome of a life full of faith in Jesus Christ. My friends, there is no, you just got to grin and bear it through life in Christianity. The call of a Christian isn't just to be tougher, smile more, stuff it down. It's not the call of Christianity. The call of being a Christ follower is that we take everything and we place it upon Christ. We realize that Christ is the very one who helps us through every opposition and gives us future deliverance from those circumstances so that his gospel, the truth of his word, will go into more lives. Paul got this. He wrote about it in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 9. Speaking of his ministry, he says, a wide door for effective work has opened to me. But then he says, but there are many adversaries. Paul understood, I'm doing this. I'm going forth. The door is open to me by God, and people hate me, but my courage is found in my faith in Jesus Christ. My friends, the unique call for us is to believe in Jesus Christ, to trust him as we serve him, to know that he will give us all the strength we need for whatever situation we face. I want to encourage you this morning that you need to trust God in all circumstances, that your faith needs to increase for the sake of His glory. You might be trying too hard on your own to somehow get through whatever it is that you're facing, and you have not yet fully found yourself collapsing on the sufficiency of Christ. I say to you today, rest upon Christ. Crumble on the very bedrock of our faith, which is Christ, and find your strength there. Paul wrote to the Philippians in chapter 1, verse 12, and then in verse 14, he said, I want you to know, brothers, that what's happened to me, in other words, the circumstances that are not pleasing, have served to advance the gospel. Pause there for a moment. Can you say that about your life? Could you say that even the circumstances of the hard marriage, the wayward kid, the unemployment, the dried up bank account, the way too many hours spent working for seemingly, seemingly nothing, the strife with the in-laws, the questions, could you say that all those things are somehow working in you to advance the gospel? That's his perspective. Come on, bring it on. All these things, they're doing something. They're, they're striving to make me more like Christ. They're driving me to make the power of Christ more known to the watching world. And then he goes on in verse 14, and he said, And most of the brothers, by watching my hardship, by watching what I've gone through, they have become more confident in the Lord by my imprisonment and much more bold to speak the word without fear. He's saying that by me having confidence to believe God's using all things for his glory, it's actually encouraging other Christians around me to live boldly and for the gospel. Maybe you're in a season where life is just awesome for you. And if you're in that season, then I would say, keep giving all glory to the Lord and say, oh, life is sweet. I walk around saying I'm one of God's most spoiled kids, right? I got so much that he gives me that I don't deserve. But I don't say, I did it because I had some, some power in me, some virtue in me that earned it. No, come on, stop that. I know myself better than that. I'm a worse sinner, I know. So not for one second, not for one second, should I ever for, uh, for, for, for any reason think that somehow my life and the advancement of the gospel in my life is because of something I've done. In the same way, when my life's falling absolutely apart, the scaffolding's falling off, the every, everything's absolute rubbish in my life, even in those moments, I could say, but you know what? God's still good. 
and I'm going to use even the worst of circumstances, the hardest things against me to advance the gospel. And I'm going to do it so that other Christians around me may be encouraged to do the same thing. Yes, we minister to an unsaved watching world, but we also minister in a family or we're surrounded by Christians that need to know we press on. Listen, I don't know where James was. I don't know where the early church was. But I have to believe that they were watching Paul's every move. And somehow this story of Jesus standing next to him got out because Luke wrote about it here in the book of Acts. They definitely were watching what he was doing and how he was relying upon Christ. And then Jesus tells him, listen, your ministry's not done. And even for me, as a weary minister at times, there are times I'm like, oh, maybe it should just be done. It should be over. And God says, no, I'm not done with you yet. And I'm like, oh, thank you. Because I was done with me. <laughs> And he says, no, I'm not done with you. Now i got to take you to Rome so you can minister there. I don't think Paul was like, oh, are you kidding me? I think he was like, yes, I will go as long as you're with me. My friends, we have the presence of Christ with us, just like Paul had it. The Lord is with us. John Newton said this quote. I love it. He said, If the Lord be with us, we have no cause of fear. His eye is upon us. His arm is over us. His ear is open to our prayers. His grace is sufficient. His promise unchangeable. Under His protection, though the path of duty should lie through fire and water, we may cheerfully and confidently pursue it. He's capturing what the Bible promises us. His, his eye is upon us. His arm is over us. His ear is open to us. Hebrews 13, 5 says, Jesus said, I will never leave you. Never will I forsake you. Do you believe that? Or are you walking into your life thinking somehow God's abandoned you? Yesterday, I was driving in my car, I turned on my audio Bible, and it started playing Exodus 33. And this story, I hadn't heard it in a while, and it captivated me once again, because I think I've had this kind of conversation with, the God, with God in the last month. Let me explain it to you. In Exodus chapter 33, God is ex explaining to Moses that he's supposed to go lead the people. God had said to Moses, you are special to me. And then Moses starts having this conversation with God. Okay, you want me to lead the people, but you're not telling me the plan. Anybody had that kind of conversation with God before? You're telling me to do something, but you're not telling me how it's going to go. So, so why don't you just go ahead and email me the PowerPoint or, or the map or whatever it is. Just download to me, God, your plan, and then we'll be on with the show. And God doesn't do that. And so Moses argues with God. And he said, listen, you told me that I'm supposed to lead these people. You also told me, I know you well, I'm paraphrasing here, but he says to him, God, you told me, I know you well, you are special to me. And so Moses says to him, if I'm so special to you, then let me in on your plan. That way I will continue to be special to you. In fact, you'll even show me how special I am because you told me your plan. And God's response is so profound. God doesn't even acknowledge his childlike question. He just simply says, my presence will go with you. I'll see your journey to the end. I'm special to you, right? Like, tell me what you're doing. Tell me how this is all going to go. My presence will go with you. I will be with you to the end of the journey. My friends, there's not anything greater that God can promise us than his presence. Even if he told you the plan, even if he told you how this whole thing was going to turn out, it wouldn't be as great as him saying, I'm with you to the end. My presence is always with you. That's the best thing he can give us. So in Acts 23, he doesn't lay out a plan for Paul. He just stands by his side. He tells him to take heart. He says, you did what I asked you to do in Jerusalem. Now on to Rome. And I will be with you. 
Where does courage come from? It comes from Christ alone. So run into your life, the gladiator battle that it is, run into your life in the name of Christ. Find courage in him and him alone. And take on the things that are pressing against you or threatening your life or threatening your peace or threatening your hope and say, in the name of Jesus, I find my courage. In the name of Jesus, I live. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, Holy God in heaven, we thank you for your goodness. In Jesus Christ specifically, we thank you for the gospel. And we thank you that by him we can live lives that please you and are for you. Lord, I pray for the Christians hearing my voice that you will give them great courage, but courage found only in your son Christ. And for those who do not know you but long to have hope in you, God, will you please call them to yourself, create in them, stir in them a hunger that only you can, and appease that hunger with your son. For we know, Father, that your son appeased your wrath so that we may be accepted. So thank you, Father, that we are accepted by the name of Christ. And now let us live fully in him this week. In the name of Jesus, my courageous Savior, the one I serve, the one I love. In the name of Christ, I pray. 